Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you to the introduction to Marine Meteorology Online course. This course is jointly developed and organized by the GMES and Africa project and the Ghana Meteorological Agency. Um, we'll just give a few minutes to see, I see there's still a couple of people joining us and then we shall begin today's session. So we'll just um, wait around for just two minutes after which we will begin today's session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again. I'd like to begin once again by thank you all for joining us for the introduction to Marine Meteorology online course, jointly organized by the GMES and Africa Project, University of Ghana and the Ghana Meteorological Agency. We'll be going through some special sessions um, between today, tomorrow and Thursday to complete this particular online course. This course is open to the vast majority of people, then cutting across um, academia, artisanal fishermen, marine operators, and basically anyone who wants to have a fair understanding of the basic principles of marine meteorology and oceanography, as well as people who want to utilize and know more about the GMES Marine Weather Service in Western and North Africa. Before we proceed, I'd like to take you briefly through the agenda. We'll be, this course will be covered in seven sessions. We're going to begin with the introduction to marine weather forecasting, looking at, looking at weather data collection and analysis procedures, looking at various forecasting techniques employed in doing the particular jobs. Um, marine weather hazards, marine weather forecasting applications, and how we communicate uh, marine weather. Would we'll end it on Thursday with the final session being the Ocean State Alerts under the GMES and Africa project. But for today, it would only be happening looking at two sessions, which is the introduction to marine weather forecasting and weather data collection, analysis and interpretation. Would we'll also give you a brief overview of the GMIS and Africa project and how it is being implemented within the western and northern parts of Africa. Before I begin, um, by this time you should have received emails individually looking at how you are going to access the GMES and Africa portal. And during the course of today's program, I will introduce you to the GMES and Africa digital learning portal. I will show you how to log in, access course materials, 
um, take your quizzes and once the course is done also access your certificate and proof of participation in this particular course. Without much ado, I think I will go in straight to demonstrate the capabilities of the GMES and Africa Digital Learning Portal. OK, so on your screens now is the home page for the GMES and Africa Portal. You should have received an email yesterday indicating the link to the portal, your username and password. So as you can see on the screen now, you have the main login page, which is going to show where you'll enter in your specific username and password. If you are experiencing problems accessing your particular, uh, the course contents, please send me an email and I'll resolve it right after the meeting. So once you have done that, you just click to log in to access the portal. This should redirect you to the home page of the portal. In case you are not redirected, direct, you are not sent directly to the course page, you can easily search the course by clicking on the search a course tab and then typing in the name of the course, in which case it is introduction to marine meteorology. And once you hit the go button or the search button, the course should pop up for you. So this is how you are going to look at the course. So it should give you information about um, the goal and the aims of the expected results as well of the course and who the various teachers are. There are a couple more teachers who will be added onto this. So please feel free to use the various um, means that have been provided you in case you have any questions. By clicking on the introduction to the marine meteorology course, it should bring you to the home page. And I see we already have 21 people who have started working and accessing materials on this course. Information on the course have been categorized per the days. So based on the agenda, you are going to find out that the seven sessions have been distributed across three days. So by clicking on each particular day, you are going to get access to the materials that have been posted or utilized during that day's session. So for instance, if I should click on day one, which is indicating the activities that we are doing today, it should bring me to all the materials that we'll be using for today. Looking at uh, information related to the basic concepts of marine weather forecasting, as well as access to the various PowerPoints that will be utilized today. So all the PowerPoint materials are, are highlighted with the name PPT. So wherever you see PPT next to the course material, this indicates where you can find the PowerPoint slides that were used for that particular presentation. Also, there will be quizzes which will not be visible in your view as of now. They are set to open once that particular day is completed. So you should, uh, it should be visible at the end of today's session and you should be able to take the quiz anytime from when it is available to you. I've also added some extra course material here on how to access Copernicus marine products. Some of these products that are also applicable to marine meteorology. And then you can also scroll through the various days by hitting any of these tabs, either to your left or to the right, to proceed to the next day or to go back to the previous day. Navigating this portal is pretty easy, and you can also do that by just clicking the course code highlighted at the top here. By clicking GMES hyphen UG hyphen 002, you should be able to navigate back to the main page. 
in the general tab, you would have information on announcements related to the course and also a discussion forum where I'd encourage you to post any questions that you might have concerning the course material in case we are not able to address them during the webinar sessions. You can click on the discussion forum and post your questions over there. You will receive your certificate of completion once all the prerequisites for this course have been uh, completed. This includes the two quizzes which needed to be completed and for you to have obtained the pass mark for this question. I'd repeat once again, if you have any questions concerning the portal, please use the Q&A tab at the top menu next to the view button and just type your questions over there. I'd also encourage you based on where you are coming from at this moment, you can briefly introduce yourselves in the chat by typing your name, your email address, and which institution and country that you are representing today. Finally, the course would only be completed once you have been able to attend all three webinar sessions and also administer you um, taking the two quizzes that have been specified in the DLP. I'd advise that if you are not able to attend all three webinar sessions for um, various reasons, being that you might have an issue with the internet connection or something else, we will try to post all the videos from the daily sessions also under the various days. So please look out for the updates in case you are not able to attend all the webinars we will post all these videos once um, each um, session is completed and you should be able to have access within um, the DLP. For an example, if you need information or the recorded video for day three, all you need to do is just click on day three and then once the video is available, it will be embedded in this page and then you should be able to view them during um, the period of the course. I would also advise that once you have any challenges, please contact me as quick as possible to resolve all these challenges before the course is archived. Once the course is archived, it becomes difficult for me to um, retrieve certain materials, access your scores, and also give you access to your certificates. So I'd advise that at least you do this within um, a month of completion of the course so that I may be able to assist you to the best of my abilities. Thank you very much for your attention. In case anyone has uh, any questions about the DLP, I'm always available. And then we will take some time also to take questions on this. I encourage you to use the Q&A tab um, at the top of your menu to drop your questions if you have any concerning the DLP, and I'll try as much as possible to resolve these for you. To start off our program today, um, we are going to look at the two main sessions I've, I've indicated already. But before we do that, I'd invite Mr. Bennett Foley. He is the Earth Observation Officer in charge of the development of services at the GMS and Africa project. Um, welcome, Mr. Bennett Foley. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. So I'll give the floor to Mr. Foley. If you can please um, share your screen with us, share your slides, and then we can start off with today's program. Thank you very much and okay. look forward to taking all your questions in the Q&A tab. Um, take it away, Mr. Foley. OK, thank you. Um, I hope you can see my screen now. Is my screen yes, showing? We can. Yes, we can okay. see your screen. Can you 
and um, put it in presentation mode. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Okay. All right, so um, good day to everyone. Um, as um, Mr. Williams said, I'm Mr. Foley, um, the head of the division of the the GMS, GMES and Africa project at the University of Ghana. And um, I'm going to take you through um, the activities of GMES in Africa um, and the EO services that have been developed um, that um, for users in um, Western North Africa. Okay, so I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the GMES in Africa project already. But I will just briefly take you through those of you who are hearing this for the first time. Um, the MES and Africa pro project is a pan Africa project um, which seeks to utilize Earth observation data for solving lots of issues on the continent. And basically, it is looking at um, areas such as marine and gas fisheries, um, bioprospecting, um, sea transport, looking at um, conflict and piracy and IUU, um, looking at uh, outer space as a driver of technology. So it covers a lot of areas and um, um, the program started uh, as the uh, as another program um, previous years ago and has metamorphosed now into the MES and Africa um, program. So basically what the program is doing is first of all to um, make sure institutions and individuals have access to free data sets, free earth observation data that can be used to develop services and to um, used to solve um, problems that are related to various areas, as I said. So the program links data providers with the data users. It's looking at um, your data uh, sets, um, past, near, real time, and real time data set. It's looking at ancillary data sets and maps. It's looking at ground data measurements, and so on and so forth. In addition to, this, to the data that is provided, the program also designs and develops services tailored towards um, some of these issues on the continent. So there are several different services um, that have been developed that are um, being um, utilized by various institutions. And also the program seeks to engage users, engage users, build capacity of users, create awareness of users about the data set, the services that are being provided. So basically, that is what the um, program does. So looking at how the program evolved, um, the program started as the Puma project from 2001 to 2006, and then changed into what we call the MSD program, which was from 2007 to 2013. And then it, um, uh, it came, became the MESA project, that's a monitoring environment and security in Africa project, 2013 to 2017, where the University of Ghana started participating. And then it then moved on to phase one of GMES and Africa project. Two, which we are in now, 2022, and to end in 2026. Now, the GMS and Africa program covers a lot of areas, including um, land and land degradation, land cover, uh, as well as um, biodiversity and marine and coastal areas. So, the University of Ghana um, is part of um, to uh, a consortium that is the uh, West Africa and North Africa areas 
um, consortium that uh, undertakes or implement is implementing the marine and coastal areas management project. There is another consortium from Southern Africa that also part, uh, um, uh, does marine and coastal areas um, services. So for the University of Ghana consortium, um, we had a, that is the MacNoah uh, consortium. We are comprised of 18 countries from West and North Africa. And then um, we have 11 partners. It used to be 10 partners, but now we are 11 partners uh, who are helping in um, developing and implementing the program. So the 12 countries I can see um, from West Africa and six countries from North Africa all adding up to 18. So we have developed six services um, for marine and coastal areas management pro, um, project. And from these services, we have um, monitoring of IUU fishing. We have monitoring and forecasting of oceanography variables. We have early warning of ocean states, um, which is our marine weather forecast service. And then we also have the monitoring coastal vulnerability and um, monitoring of coastal ecosystem and habitats. Um, and then new one that we have added during this phase is the oil spill monitoring um, service. So basically, um, we can categorize all these services into three main categories, which is the fishery services, oceanographic services, and then the call um, services. For the fishery services, we have um, provision of potential fishing zone uh, maps or information. And this fishing zone, potential fishing zone maps, comprise of uh, uh, maps that tells you where to find fish possibility, the possibility of finding fish at certain locations. And it's sometimes overlaid with vessel traffic in order to know uh, where fishing activities are being undertaken. And again, you have uh, statistics of vessels being provided to countries to indicate um, fish, uh, fishing vessels that are doing illegal activities. And then for the oceanographic services, we have uh, we provide daily forecast of oceanographic variables, um, and also we have uh, sea state forecast maps, um, which we provide every day. And then we have a mobile app that um, we use to disseminate our early warning alerts, as well as a USSD uh, code that is developed for Ghana and Nigeria. And when we come to the coastal services, we have shoreline maps um, being provided that shows uh, areas of erosion and accretion. We know that erosion is a major problem um, in Africa. And so we provide um, areas of uh, shoreline change where there is erosion. And then we also have um, we develop coastal vulnerability maps from these erosion maps. We also have land use land cover maps that um, we provide to users, and um, um, these land use land cover maps mostly indicate uh, areas of mangrove um, uh, cover, as well as uh, where there has been changes in land use. So, as I said, for the potential for the fishery service, um, we have maps as you can see. On the left side, um, the left side top map is a potential fishing zone map, which indicates areas that you have high potential of finding fish and areas of low potential of finding fish. And beneath it is the uh, the potential fishing zone map overlaid with vessel traffic. You can see areas where the vessels are aggregated, and with this map, you are able to um provide this information to fishers agents who use this to go and police the um the waters for illegal activities 
And the other graph on uh, in the middle, which shows you the, the bar, the bars indicate vessels from various countries that are operating in the what of West and North Africa. So you pick a particular country and you look at which vessels are operating in the uh, exclusive economic zones of that country and we, we provide information on them. For oceanographic services, we have information, both forecast as well as real time and um, archive information on wave height, sea surface temperature, sea surface height, winds, um, sea surface currents. And we normally also produce um, bulletins from these maps uh, occasionally. For the coastal services, we have the um, coastal vulnerability maps that have been developed and produced. We produce bulletins from it that is on the left side. Um, this is a sample of the coastal vulnerability map, which indicates areas that action need to be taken in the red color and areas that need less action to be taken, that is in the blue color. And in the middle, we have the uh, mangrove map, um, which indicate um, area of um, high change. <coughs> Sorry. And you can see areas of um, good mangrove cover. And then we prove on the right side, you can have, uh, we have a bulletin from these coastal services. And we come to our um, alert services marine um, forecast alert service which we provide through mobile apps we have developed a mobile app for um, android as well as ios and you can find this uh, for android you can google you can search for it using the gmesug so the name of the app is gmesug you can search and download and this provides information on four days forecast um, it provides both map, which you can see um, the map telling you areas of uh, the ocean that can be rough, calm, or dangerous. I'm going to go into details of this um, in the coming days in, the, in another session, where I'll provide the details of how we generate this information and uh, more information about the app, as well as a USSD service that we have developed where you dial a simple code to receive forecasts. So as I said, we develop um, bulletins from all this uh, information, which we disseminate to users. And Ghana Meteorological Agency, who is a partner, plays a significant role in um, this, uh, providing this information. We also build capacity in various uh, sectors in all the services that we have developed in data acquisition, processing, and dissemination as well. And these are some of the um, capacity building sessions that we have held in the past. And today is one of uh, the such sessions uh, as we are witnessing as well. We also work with the private sector in developing services, as well as um, uh, making sure we have uh, continuity in the uh, EO business by um, encouraging startups to, to be come into the EO sector, um, prototype materials or equipment for data collection, and also um, automate data collection, data analysis, and basically to develop the youth, the rest of the youth in this sector. And then we also make sure we engage um, academ academia as well as the young people, more especially the ladies who are very adamant in, in joining the science um, domain as well as the earth observation domain. So we try to encourage women and girls to participate to um, take part in this, to make use of EO data, to develop uh, new things 
to build their capacity in the area of EO. And so we have worked with secondary school um, pupils or students, and uh, as well as universities um, um, students as well, uh, mainly um, females. So we have various channels through which we communicate and disseminate uh, information. Um, we have our blog, um, we have our main website as well. We have our Twitter pages and Facebook as well. We have a YouTube channel where we upload our, our videos. I will encourage all of you to follow us on our social media pages, Twitter, Facebook, and the blog. visit the blogs, visit the website for information and contact us where you need any help and as well as um, if you need data, if you need um, um, help in analyzing the data, the services, if you are having trouble accessing the services and all, all of that, just contact us and then we will get to you. I hope that um, this presentation has been very useful to you and I'd like to say thank you in many languages as my colleague Ignatius always does, but I would like to say it in my language, Akwe, which is Ewe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Foley. Akwe to you too. And um, we have a couple of people joining us from Togo, and I know this language isn't too different from theirs also, if we can confirm. I think we have one person, at least I noticed, Agnesa Taduna from Togo also. I think she would appreciate that as well. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Foley. And we'll take um, our advice that you please keep your questions. Um, for now, we would have a question session right after the next presentation, and then we'll address all those questions. If uh, you can also add advice that please put all your questions in the Q&A tab, just so that you don't forget them. And once we are done with the next session, I'll open up the floor to address all the concerns that you have. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of other trainers who are um, on board with us today. It is not only those that you see presenting, but we also have the presence of those who will be taking us to other sessions who will be here today. And I would also want to invite them to get interactive with us in case they want to add any um, extra comments to the presentations that have been done so far, or they also want to attempt to address some of the questions that will be asked. We have these um, key experts being drawn from the Ghana Meteorological Agency and they are here with us today to assist with us. Moving on, we'll go straight to session two, which is looking at, sorry, session one, which is looking at the introduction to marine weather forecasting. In this particular session, we are going to be looking at a brief overview to marine weather forecasting, the importance, why do we need it, and some concepts on meteorology and oceanography. So to do that for us, we have Mr. Thomas Biney from the Ghana Meteorological Agency to take us through this particular session. Mr. Thomas Biney, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Mr. Biney. So I'd invite you to share your screen with us and then we can proceed. I hope you can see my screen, sir. Yes, we are seeing it very clearly. Thank you very much, Mr. Baini, and I'd like you to proceed with your presentation at this time. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. So we are looking at introduction to marine weather forecasting. Basic marine weather forecasting. As the uh, facilitator said, we're looking at overview of marine forecasting. We will look at uh, the timelines and where we've got into in terms of marine forecasting. 
we will also be looking at the importance of marine weather forecasting and basic concept of meteorology and oceanography. Looking at the key timelines or events in history and the evolution of marine weather forecasting, uh, the first International Marine Time Conference was held in the 19th century, 1853. And uh, this was due to loss of vessels, properties, and lives at sea, which led to the first International Meteorological Conference and the establishment of the International Meteorological Organization. In 1912, the sinking of the Titanic also led to the development of international safety of life at sea, the SOLAS Convention, which we are, most of us are abreast with, which is basically concerned with safety of life at sea. And looking at somewhere 2011, a major development came up, the introduction of the MET areas. Those of us who are in uh, aeronautical meteorology are conversant with what we call the flight information region. When we move into the seas or the ocean, there has been a, a demarcation of the oceans across the globe. And that is what we call, it was introduced in 2001 by the World Meteorological Organization and also International Meteorological, uh, yes, International Maritime Conference when they met and they came up with organization when they came together. And this also has coordinators for each of these met areas. So as we see the ocean, though it looks like we have the Pacific, we have the Atlantic, the North Atlantic, the South Atlantic, vast ocean or vast sea, there are demarcations. We have the territorial waters. When we get there, I will talk more about it. Why marine time or marine weather forecasting? Over the years, as I said, due to loss of life and properties, this has become of key concern to uh, everyone, uh, states, uh, individuals, because of the losses. If we look at what I am showing you right now, there was an accident that caused, that was caused by low visibility, which is as a result of fog patches. Imagine if uh, the weather was issued or advice was issued before, indicating that there is low visibility or fog patches, which will impede visibility. I'm sure the captain or the skipper on the ship or the boat would have taken precautionary measures. This accident was also caused as a result of conditions of shoaling, uh, adverse con maritime conditions because of shoaling of swell. In South Africa in 2017, uh, a preliminary report shows that a skipper who ignored weather result, weather reports landed in an accident. He neither looked at the forecast or the prevailing weather condition. It was not taken into account. And about 64 passengers and four crew on board almost lost their lives. In Ghana, last year, there was a fishing vessel that sank around Elmina. And the report indicated that the captain uh, ignored the warning signs of a storm. Uh, apparently, the Ghana Meteorological Agency had issued and indicated that there will be a storm on the next day, which was ignored. If you look at the warning that was published, the news item that was published by the news agency, it says that according to some of the surviving crew, the vessel sank with all the crew on board because it could not sustain the balance due to the heavy rains and tender storms. So I'm sure if the crew and the captain had heeded to the advice from Ghana Meteorological Agency, it wouldn't have landed itself in that accident. Now, who is responsible for weather forecasting? Who is responsible for marine weather forecasting? But before you even forecast, do you know of your met area as a country? Or you can be in Ghana and you are, you'll be uh, forecasting for the territorial waters of uh, 
other country. According to the Bremo, this demarcation must work according to plan in order to harmonize the individual advisories that will be issued from the various meteorological agencies or the hydrological services. Are you aware of the exclusive economic zone of your country as uh, a weather service provider? Now, this is the Debriamo Met area. If you, if I should take Ghana, where I come from, my country, we are in Met area two, and the coordinator is France. So they give a general advisory over this region, but we have responsibility of taking care of our exclusive economic fishing zone. As uh, Mr. My brother Ignatius said earlier, uh, all the materials have been uploaded and you will see these links. All these links will lead you to knowing uh, the exact place or the information that I'm projecting to you. So the links that are on the slides are to help you get the materials I am speaking to. So you can get to know your exclusive economic fishing zone. Let me take you to Ghana. Although we are in Met Area 2, we, have don't, we don't have the responsibility of issuing advisory for the entire Met Area. The advisory will be issued by France, but we have the responsibility of issuing safety advisory for our Met Area our territorial waters or our exclusive economic fishing zone, which extends to about 200 nautical miles from the coastline. So this is Ghana's exclusive economic fishing zone. You can use this link to assess yours. Now, marine weather forecast. Marine weather forecast uh, is a bit different from the general weather forecast. This is because it has tidal and wave information included and most of the time the parameters that we look at are the sea surface temperature the significant wave height the tidal wave heights the wave current and direction the speed and the direction and also swell period and direction marine weather forecast does not concern itself only with oceanic parameters but also the parameters that affect the ocean the atmosphere above the ocean for instance the surface winds the visibility and also the uh, expected weather conditions in terms of tender storms, rains, strong winds, or gale force winds. Generally, uh, the marine weather forecast is produced by the National Met Services or Hydrological Services. And uh, it is done by using observation from ships, from coastal stations, and also um, weather satellites, buoys, and also lighthouses. So marine forecast bulletins can be in various forms, as we know. They can be in various forms, which are updated as and when it becomes necessary. We have the regular marine weather forecast, which normally lasts 24 to 48 hours. And this one I have at the top right corner is a typical one, and it has information on visibility, sea surface temperature, tidal wave height, and uh, wave current. Visibility, yes, visibility is also captured over there. And there's a typical one from the South African um, weather services. We have the extended marine forecast which is also a type of forecast which is issued for a period of three to five days and is intended for long-term planning. And this is a typical one that Ghana Meteorological Agency issue for its uh, stakeholders. If you look at this one, this one is also from South African Med Services. This one was issued for three days. And we have the coastal and maritime weather warnings, which can come in as and when it becomes necessary. The forecast or the advisory within the 24 hours are issued regularly, but the warnings and the uh, advisories can come in when you see any adverse weather condition which may counter what you issued earlier. So, for instance, this 
the forecaster on duty has seen a storm, a mesoscale convective cloud, which is going to produce rain and tender storms and to affect activities over the exclusive economic zone of Ghana. So he issues an advisory or a weather warning telling stakeholders that it is not safe at sea since the Solar's Convention is concerned with safety of life at sea. Warnings are issued for um, adverse weather conditions like tropical cyclones, gales and storms, and also ice accretion if it is applicable in your area, and also restricted visibility. Most of the time, one nautical mile or less. So we'll be looking at some oceanic parameters and how they affect activities on the ocean or marine time activities, especially uh, when it comes to uh, fishing. Significant wave height is very key because it is usually the parameter that is used to determine the state of the sea, whether it's going to be rough, it's going to be calm, or it's going to be dangerous. This uh, definition is also dependent on the agreement with stakeholders. Though WMO has its own threshold, but the local, there can be a local agreement depending on the kind of vessels that work within your territorial waters or borders. Now, if you are to look at this one carefully, you can see that when the significant wave height, the wave height was low, it could, the, the, the vessel could move smoothly. But as soon as the wave height, the vessel increased or went very high, the vessel couldn't move as it should, and it's even capsized. We also look at the tidal wave height. Basically, tides are the rising and the falling of the sea level. And we monitor the movement of the moon as a result. As, uh, and this gives us an idea when to have high tides and low tides in order for us to regularly and uh, correctly forecast because we know that when the tides are high, the water levels are high, and the significant wave height is also high. And although it could contribute to the level or the rising of the waves, and this can also impede the activities of uh, mariners. So it's of key importance. Let's look at a little demonstration here. If you look at the significant, if you look at the position of the moon. If we at new moon, the pull from the sun and the moon is massive. So we have very high tide. But when the moon is at right angle with the sun, there is a pull here, there is a pull here. So the gravitational pull becomes somehow equal. So we don't really have high tides. In the same way, when we have full moon, we have a massive pull. So height of the ocean becomes very high of the waters. The water levels rises, sorry. Now we also look at the wave current. Wave currents are very important because if you know the movement and the direction of the water mass, you know where to move your vessel, especially for without fisher folk. If you are to move against the direction of the current, which means you are going to burn a lot of fuel in overcoming or reaching haul speed. So having the direction and also the speed gives you an idea. In aeronautics, if you have a tailwind, you know that at some point you could, you wouldn't use a lot of aviation fuel. In the same way, in the uh, fishing uh, activities, in fishing activities, if you have uh, the idea of the current, the water current, their movement, and their direction and speed, you are able to plan accordingly. One thing that the wave current, speed, and direction also help is that 
eggs and larvae of fish and other animals drift with the karen from the spawning ground to nursery areas where they feed and grow. So karens also influence the bottom dwelling species such as crabs, lobster, and shellfish settle as adults. It also contributes to the uh, uh, flow of feed from one place to another. So it's very, very important. And if you look at what I've, just, I've pointed here, currents affect the availability of nutrients for plant growth and other availability of food for marine animals. So current eddies also serve as fertile feeding grounds for marine life. So it's good to know the current. We have sea surface temperature, which plays a very huge role when it comes to the marine environment, both for research and also for marine life. The wind also is very key. I want all of us to pay attention and look at the demonstration from all the video that is being played here and look at the correlation between the wind speed, the ocean surface, and also the coastal or the coastline. I'll play the video. Okay, so as the wind speed increases, now we have 25 knots, 30 knots. Okay, so this gives us an idea that when there is a storm on the ocean, there could be a surge, even though you are expecting calm ocean states. But if there should be a storm you are expecting, the sea surface, your models may be telling you that uh, the significant wave height is uh, calm is going is 1.2 so it's going to be calm yet you are expecting a storm to move over your territorial waters that could cause a surge because it's coming with a massive wind and it's going to influence the ocean states visibility as we know poor visibility can be encountered at sea you know fog and uh, mist can impede visibility and it can even cause collusion for areas when there are vessels, uh, traffic uh, prone areas where maybe everyone is moving here and there. And we know there are a lot of vessels in our territorial waters, especially those of us who are close to the ports. Knowing the visibility, poor visibility can really lead to massive accident. If you are even getting close to uh, the seashore where uh, there are sea mounts and other uh, you may not be able to see. You may run yourself into uh, some rough surface which may lead to accident. So what is the significance of marine weather? Is it important that marine weather forecasting be done considering all that has been happening on, in and around us? Basically, safety of life at sea and marine operations is the most important aspect of marine or what is so important when it comes to marine weather forecasting is to save life and also to help with smooth operations of marine activities. Also to promote efficiency and, economic, and economy of marine activities. I talked about knowing the current speed and direction. If you move against the current, you are going to spend a lot to overcome and also to reach hull speed. So this can lead to if uh, through marine weather forecast, we are able to save life, we are able to save people from losing their properties and also to prevent people from sustained injuries, loss of time and also economic loss. This is a video that was uh, published by by uh, the World Meteorological Organization is in there. You can watch it when you download the material. So this brings us to the end of the first session. And if you have any question, you can put it in the Q&A session and it will be addressed. Whilst we look at the video.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thomas Viney. I think that was very insightful. And if I didn't get anything at all from the presentation, the only thing that stuck with me was, do you know your met area? Obviously I do not, but I've learned something today. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'd like to take um, a few questions now that were asked during your presentation. So the first one is looking at, are there any disciplinary actions when one ignores marine weather forecasts? So you can take it from the angle of, um, let's say fishermen, from the angle of port authorities, from the angle of commercial vessels. Are there any disciplinary actions for some of these um, operators of these particular vessels? if they ignore marine forecasts? Yeah, from where I sit as a meteorologist working for working with the Ghana Meteorological Agency, we don't uh, uh, come up with the display actions, but I know that Ghana Marine Time Authority, they are in charge of uh, the marine space and also the inland waters. So they will have to do that and I know there are rules and regulations uh, regarding that. So I don't know about your country, so you can find out. I don't know if uh, your question is answered. Please, can you get me? Sorry, I, lo I lost you during the, the final part of um, you answering it. So I just want to get it clear. Legally, um, are vessel operators mandated to seek advice from, let's say, MET agencies or any particular port authorities before they head out, or there's nothing? Is there anything that binds them to listen out for forecasts or anything that prevents them from going out to sea? if there yeah, should be for, turbulent for, conditions outside. Yeah, from our side, we don't have any, uh, or there's no law that binds them. Yet, yet, when there is an accident, an investigation is going on, you can be queried, knowing that Ghana Meteorological Agency is capable of issuing advisories, but no one is, uh, uh, they, they are not legally Legally, there are no laws that binds them. OK, OK, thank you very much. I'll move on to the next question. So there's this question from Agnesa. Is there a particular coordination between the area covered by GMES and Africa Project and the Met Area Zone 2, which is under the authority of France? Okay, so uh, from, okay, I'm showing the met areas. You know, the met areas, as I said, if you come to Ghana, for instance, Ghana Meteorological Agency is the watch office for, they, we watch over the FIRL, Ghana, Togo, Benin, okay? Yet, yet, the Meteorological Services Department in these nations are responsible for what happens in their aerodromes. Ghana, France is the one in charge of the Met area and issues a general advice. But we are responsible for our exclusive economic fishing zone. And if you click here, it will take you to, and you'll be able to select your economic fishing zone, which allows you to know the extent to which it can go to. But with GMS and Africa, I think GMS and Africa is looking at West Africa and North of Africa. So we are still within the MET area too. Hello, Ignatius. Yes, I can hear you. You went you went away for some bits, but um, 
just for before you concluded, I think you were talking about uh, Met Area 2, and I think there are parts of North Africa that aren't really covered by Met Area 2. I think that one is covered by Spain, where you have the areas between Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia. That's that, that, um, aspects also. Yeah. And I just yeah. want to add on that the GMS and Africa project is willing to collaborate with um, especially meteorological institutions to extend some of the services that it is implementing within this region. It has already started in Ghana, in Nigeria, it's making some efforts in Gambia and Senegal. So it would be best to have that association with national meteorological agencies so that they can also more or less inherit the benefits that come along with the GMES in Africa project. I think there's a question for Mr. Foley. Um, two people have asked um, a similar question and it's looking at how do you communicate with canoes at sea in the use of your forecast? Mr. Foley, if you're there. Yeah, okay, thank you. So for canoes at sea, um, so what we have done is for us to let them access the information before they go to sea. But just in case they have already gone to sea, um, currently um, they can only access it where they, they are able to access the mobile networks. If they have their phone with them and the mobile networks can reach them, then they can access the information. Other than that, they have to access the information ahead of time before going. Um, there is also the plan to um, equip them with devices that they can use to communicate um, to the security agencies um, like the navies. When they are in trouble, they can um, uh, uh, send an SOS message. And that was piloted um, some uh, few years back. And we are hoping that the government will also take that one up to uh, implement it uh, nationwide. But apart from that, individuals must be responsible for their uh, safety as well. So they have to make sure they get information prior to embarking on their ocean expeditions. And so I will encourage them to do that. Meanwhile, um, they should also try as much as possible. When they go to see where they have network, they make use of it. But it, if they have to go beyond range, they have to um, be very careful. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Foley. And the little that I'd want to add to it is that currently all the information for the artisanal fishermen or the fishermen using the canoes are accessible via the GMS UG app. So I'd advise that if you do not have the short code in your country currently, you can download this app and then have access to all the information on um, or the ocean states before the fishermen go out to sea or even when they are at sea. And this information is available for all the 18 countries that we work with in English, in French, and even in Portuguese. On Thursday, Mr. Foley will go much into detail about how this information is generated and how you can also access it and utilize the app to the best of its abilities. And one final question before we move on. There's a question from Kwesi Chum. He says, how are the tides and significant wave heights measured? Are you using in-situ or modeled data? And how is it validated if it is modeled? Okay, with for Ghana Meteorological Agency, we use both in situ and uh, also modeled uh, data. So we have tidal gauges which have been installed at the. We have one at Tema and we have another one at uh, Takra Airport. So for the West Coast and also the East Coast, that one is for the observed data, and we also have modeled data as well, and they are validated. We using so the model data which is used for the forecast is validated using the observed data which is collected at the various stations.
Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Thomas Viney. And also, I'd like to um, remind all of you that there is some information on the Copernicus Marine products for both in situ and uh, modeled products that are available um, on the Copernicus platform. Information on how to retrieve this has been posted on the digital learning platform. So if you're interested in any of these data sets, please um, use that information, visit their websites and get um, all the information you need. I'll take one last question before we move to the next session. What is the what is the significance of high tidal wave height and sorry, significant wave height to low line coastal communities? Okay, so uh, if you look at the incident that happened uh, over uh, Keta about two years ago, uh, you know, Keta is about one meter above sea level, which is a low lying area. And that particular day, significant wave height was expected to be uh, 1.8 meters. And the tidal heights were also expected to be around 1.89, with a storm also moving over the ocean, which caused a surge. These are two waves coming together. There will be superimposition of wave, interference of wave, which will increase the amplitude. So looking at a low-lying area like that, water mass will move in, which is being driven by the storms, which were directed, uh, which had, uh, were moving towards the coastline. The place is low-lying. The water levels have risen, and it must surely break when it gets there there is nothing to break it because the land has gone down in the water level so it will come in like and affect the coastal areas so it's very very important in forecasting knowing the significant wave height and also especially tidal wave heights around this time when there are a lot of storms coming in whenever there is a surge and you are in a low-lying area and the storm moves towards you it's likely there could be some floods. So it's very, very important in monitoring coastal floods and erosion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Baini. As you prepare um, for the next session, which is session two, um, I'd like to handle one. I know I've said one final question for so many times, but I think this will be the final question <laughs> for this session because um, <laughs> it is very important that we address some of the issues that come up. So I think this is going specifically to Mr. Bennett Foley. Um, it says, what has been the success rate in the use of mobile, of the mobile for forecasting by fishermen? Do you collaborate with the regulator of the fishery to propagate the mobile app? Yeah. What is um, the success rate of your service and how are you collaborating if you do with um, the regulator of that particular industry? Yeah, so this as we collaborate with um, GMET to provide information, we also collaborate with several institutions like the Fisheries Commission uh, who normally oversee the activities of the fishermen. Um, especially as like fishermen, they, they work with them hand in hand. So we have been working with the Fisheries Commission over the years. And um, I must tell you that the, the rate at which the fishermen uh, uptake this service is very high. In fact, um, since last year, last year, April, let's say just a year ago, we've had about 80,000 sessions or accesses, access by fishermen to the ussd just the ussd platform excluding the, the 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 mobile app just the ussd app platform had about over eighty thousand assets and just yesterday um about 330 people 370 people assessed the platform to look at um the weather forecast last year i guess for instance over 400 people assessing in one particular day so telling you how important the 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 service is to them and how much they rely on this service as well. So 
that is just some brief information for you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Foley. Um, <laughs> someone says the last of last questions. <laughs> I know, but at times I think it is very important that some of these particular um, institutions get to handle some of these questions once they are given the opportunity. I'd like to stop here. And for those who have more um, question on the mobile application and how this service is developed, um, Thursday is the day for you because we have a whole session on just that particular application. And then we'll be looking at how it is developed, how it is disseminated, and also how to build collaborations between countries to be able to uptake the service. This is a service that comes at no cost to the artisanal fishermen. So you can see how much the service is being appreciated and it is being used. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Baini, I think we would like to move on to session two for now. We are going to look at the second session, which is looking at the types of um, weather data, the instruments used, the sources, and then how um, have a small practical session also. In case I haven't addressed um, your question so far, I apologize. If it hasn't been addressed properly also, please um, just put a follow-up question in the Q&A or in the chat and I'll refer it back to the speakers. So I'm hoping before the end of the second session, we would have enough time and we can come back to follow up on some of these questions. Thank you very much. So Mr. Baini, I'll leave the floor for you to continue with session two. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So uh, we are looking at whether data collection, analysis, interpretation, uh, so if you have any question uh, regarding the first, I need some clarification. Uh, you can leave it there or you can, you, our emails will be circulated and I can address it for you. Thank you. So we will be looking at types of weather, uh, whether these are objectives and uh, with the types of weather data, basically we have the observational data and the numerical weather prediction data, the modeled data. And they are the observed data runs from weather buoys, uh, from satellite data, uh, scattermeter data, altimeter radar, and we have also the institute, the buoys, and the HAF data anemometer, and also other sensors. We also have uh, human observations, basically uh, on ships and also at the coastal stations. If you look at Ghana, for instance, we have. Uh, a number of the coastal stations spread across our coast and also the upper air sounding mostly around the coastal areas and islands or uh, island waters. With the numerical prediction data, we have the unified global models and you can have some uh, with the uh, ECMWF, we have some with resolution of 1.5 kilometers and 4 kilometers. We have the wave watch models and the GFS from NOAA and also uh, ECMWF. All these are available for free. Uh, most of the, the instruments that are used to collect some of this data are satellites and we have the scattermeter, I've mentioned all of them, and we have the human observation in upper air sounding. The radar is also available and in some countries, in some countries, and if you do not have and you have the institute or the model data, some of the model data are very, very good. And some, if you check Copernicus, for instance, we have near real time data there, which can help you in your forecast if you don't have observed data in your area. This is a drift, a typical example of a drifting buoy. Uh, which is anchored, uh, a drifting buoy which floats and drifts with the current over the ocean. And we have uh, the mod buoy or the anchored, anchored buoy, uh, which 
also collect various atmospheric and oceanic uh, parameters. It has sensors installed on it, which collect the data for the various, uh, where the, for the area which it has been installed. If you need more information on better, you can check from the Data Buoy Corporation panel, and I have the link here. It will give you uh, where buoys have been disseminated or deployed in and around the world. So some of the information that you can get from the institute measurement, you can get from buoys. There's uh, the temperature, wind direction, you can get pressure, you can get wave period and height, also salinity, or, uh, salinity you can get it for various depths. And uh, we have the current speed and direction. Some can also help you with uh, the swell, height, and uh, also the direction. Satellite observation. Most of the time, about 80% of, uh, most of the data on the ocean are collected by satellite. And they are modeled into uh, sometimes near real-time data, which is available on set so many platforms and with the satellite the microwave uh, the microwave is used since it's able to penetrate uh, through the clouds which mostly covers the atmosphere during uh, the rainy seasons or the summer for most of the countries so it's able to collect data the microwave uh, range gives is used by most of the satellites and same with the radar too if you want to have a look at how it works, the techniques behind it, how it observes, the, uh, the, it observes parameters and over the ocean, this is the techniques you can go through it. Everything, the steps are here. The scatterometer also uses almost the same techniques. The backscatter is what is uh, used to calculate the either the roughness or the smoothness or the calmness of the ocean. And depending on what the angle and also the uh, fly at uh, the, the level where it is, the nearness to the ocean is able to give you information on that. Okay, so we have the altimeter observation also which also uses the same, the microwave pulse as it's transmitted and energy reflected from the surface goes back to the altimeter. When it goes back, there's an algorithm which is used to calculate the parameter. Looking at, if you are looking at the significant wave height, it's able to, and also the levels of the water in terms of tides, it's able to, using that same technique. This is a typical example of ship observation. If you look at the ship, for instance, uh, there is someone who is observing. And if you look at this one, there is an installed instrument, weather instrument up here, which collects data as the ship moves. So we have a lot of voluntary observing ships in and around our waters. As they move, doing their activities, since they have this uh, instruments on board, they collect data and they transmit them. And that's what we call the VOS, Voluntary Observing Ship Scheme. It was developed by the WMO and also uh, the Intergovernmental uh, Oceanic Commission and UN nations for uh, research purposes and also for safe sailing of ships and other vessels. Okay, so these are the parameters or the weather variables that the ship observation also that since it has like an automatic weather station on land but on sea just that this one it is it has the ability to collect data on waves and also that of swell and if there is ice conditions and also ice accretion it's able to give information and you are able to focus relative humidity is not left out wind speed and direction are also captured now, sources of weather data, basically all the observations that are made 
and also those that are made and all those that are also made uh, remote that are transmitted or are made available on the global telecommunication system. So they are transmitted through the GTS and they are made available for operational purposes. Weather maps and charts are also made available, some from the we uh, wave watch models from the GNOA, some also from ECMWF and other sources. And if you look at this, this one is a model or weather map or chart for significant wave height. This one is also for wave height. And this one, we are having the wind direction. So we have various of them and they are available for free. Others, you have to pay for the services, but I will share all the links with you. They are in the slides and I will take you through them. We also have satellites and radar, radar images available which helps in weather forecasting. On, we have currently in our part of the world, the Meteosat second generation satellite uh, gives us information, weather information, and it's available to us. Some advanced countries have now zoomed into the Meteosat third generation. They are using that one, which has a radar component installed on it. But as it stands now, we do not have that in our part of the world. But if you have a weather radar installed in your locality, or in your area, you can also have access to information along the coast and also at sea. These are some of the channels that are used. Basically, we use the visible channel, the near infrared wave and uh, water vapor channel and the infrared channels for, the, for our forecasting. And these are the main observational applications for them on the Meteosat second generation, which is widely used. And there's a typical display of radar image. Now, looking at this one, if you look at it, the radar image can also give information not only on weather uh, clouds, but is able to help us get information on hills or the, uh, it's, it's some, some are able to even predict uh, some level of or the amount of rain expected uh, to maybe move over your area. And we know these are important. Atmospheric parameters are very important when it comes to weather uh, data collection because the atmosphere also influences the ocean surfaces. There is this coupling or the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere constantly. So the ocean, the atmosphere above the ocean, its variables are very, very key. As I said earlier, if there is a storm, a strong moving storm passing over the ocean and you expect the ocean to be calm, since there is a storm, it's going to influence the parameters. And if you're not careful, it may lead to a devastating situation at sea. And this is basic radar interpretation if you would want to know more. Thank you. This is a little about the theory and uh, we have information on the practical session. I don't know if uh, Ignatius, should I continue with it or we will come back to that one? I think you can continue for now. We we did spend a bit more time on the previous Q&A, but we still have some time. So I'd rather we go quickly through the demonstrations and then we can look at the Q&A. OK, great. So I talked about satellite data and uh, with the radar and uh, satellite images. You can have satellite images from the UMESAT. So I've made all these links available can click on it. Let me take you to one of them. Please, I hope you can see my screen. Please, can you see the satellite, the you may start? No, I, I, I think we're still seeing your PowerPoint slides. So okay. if you can um, switch to the screen on your browser. OK.
yeah please i hope you can see it now you can yes, see it now perfect yes, yes, we, yes can. we can see great it. great so uh this is how the umesat uh, data services page looks like you can log in if you have an account with them or you can register and log in but without even registration you can have access to whether uh, uh, information for instance if you look at this okay let me start from scratch if you want to add layer a particular this is the base but if you want to add a particular satellite image you go to add layer then this type of satellite you are looking at i am interested in the uh, zero degree which captures my area and i can go to the visualized products yeah, you have active fire monitoring, which is not what we are looking at. So uh, I can get information on the cloud, cloud top height. I want to know the extent of the cloud or the storm, which is uh, over the ocean currently. I want to know the top. I can add it. I will come there and I will look at the temperatures over there, which allows me to estimate the cloud top height. I can also add convection RGB. Uh, if they want to see if there are some convective activities over my area, I can add. Once you click Add to Map, it comes to the main page, and you are able to look at it and assess the current information or monitor if there is something going on over there. So there are a lot of them. For instance, you have the fog and the low cloud. You can add that one, which gives you information if there are. After that, you can click close now if you come here i want to look at the fog so i will just have to click on this one okay it's loading let's give it some time i think it's my internet so uh, mr viney yes Yes, I, I know you. I know you work with the Ghana Meteorological Agency, so you are you are used to zooming in into Ghana. But we have um, participants yes. from all over <laughs> Africa. So for, okay. if you can do me this favor, we've been looking at West Africa for a while now. If we can also have a look slightly, if we can go a bit up north, I'd appreciate it. Okay, so I'll move there. <laughs> so currently. I can show, I, have, I want to show whether there are fog or low clouds developed over the northern portions of Africa. So what I have to do is to hide the other layers. Okay, so I have information now on only low clouds and fog. And uh, that's, I have a link that I have shared on this same slide which allows with the interpretation. If you go to UCA and also MetEd, you can go there and learn about the interpretation. Because looking at it from this, uh, it will be very difficult for you to interpret except an aspect. So we can see some clouds that are over these regions. So clouds have been developed over there. Now, let's move on to add more of the... Okay. Sentinel, okay, we have products also from here. Chlorophyll concentration and all that. They are all available here and you can have information on that. Let's move on to the next one. We've looked at the satellite. Let's move on to the buoy data. Let's look at buoy. Please, I hope you can still see my browser. Yes, we can. Yes, so that one, the link is also there. This gives you information on where, uh, where the buoys have been disseminated all over the world, and you are able to assess information. Once that buoy is active, you can select your region, uh, you can Okay, now the selected region is, let me, let me add all these ones, partners, very good. So you can add and you will see those in your territorial waters. For instance, if you add over, 
around uh, Cabo Verde, you can see that there are some uh, buoys in the North Atlantic Ocean. And you can click on them, and information will be given here. So currently, we have the winds that are being OK. So UK Met Office have deployed those buoys, and they are here. So if you can see, the winds are 18 knots, and the atmospheric pressure over there, 30.28 inches, and we have air temperature uh, 50. Yeah, temperature 59 Fahrenheit, dew point temperature, and also the sea surface temperature 59.2. So you can have information here. Let's look at this one. So within our territorial waters, okay, there is a mod buoy at the location uh, 000, latitude 0, latitude 0. Okay, and currently there isn't any, it's off, there isn't information over there. Let's move to parts of uh, Senegal. Let's see. Yeah. They are having some data. It's active. I think those in red. OK, it's here. The key is here. stations with no data in last eight hours are in red. And those with historical data, they are in uh, is it beige color over here. So you can have access to uh, buoy data within your territorial waters over here. Those of us in the uh, MET area too. Let's move on to assessing upper air sounding information. So we want to know how the atmosphere looks like. Do we have moisture in the atmosphere? Is that likely? Is it likely that there will be some development of convective activities which will worry our uh, users or the, our marine users? You have to look at all these things. And these ones are modeled data. These are modeled data. So which allows you to select any part of the ocean. So for instance, let's move here. Let's click here. Very good. So what information do you want? You want Stability time series, you can choose. You want, okay, sounding. How the atmosphere looks like. Let's choose. It will give us information on that. You click go. Then it opens. So this is developed by NOAA. And it's called the Air Resource Laboratory. So all parameters or how the atmosphere, atmosphere has been modeled at any point in time to give you information. You click on next. Then you enter this key here. The access code allows you to view what you have selected. So do you want QT? Uh, let's say, uh, do you want it to plot the atmosphere such that uh, you know how temperatures are behaving? You know how, uh, whether there is moisture, or you know that there is a likelihood that there will be a development which will impede activities on the ocean. So you enter the key. It can be caps, it can be, it's not uh, case sensitive. OK, so that part of the ocean that we click is giving us information that if you look up to from the surface up to about 800 millibar level in the atmosphere, the atmosphere over the ocean is quite dry. It's not so moist, but from the mid level, about 700 hectopascal or millibar level, you see that there is some level of moisture and there is, should I say, near saturation being seen around the mid portions of the atmosphere. And you can click on the text results here and it will give you the data on that. Okay, so you see at each level, how the temperature is behaving is giving the relative humidity is giving you everything. If you don't want it this way to, instead of clicking on the text results, you can click on the sounding text and it will give you everything together like this. So this gives you the atmospheric profile over the area, but it's a modeled data. It's not a real time 
data. Other, some nations do the pilot balloon or the sounding, and they have real-time data. Um, Ghana Meteor used to have that one, 2016. We had, I think, 2022, we were doing the pilot sounding, but at the moment, uh, it's on hold. Let's move on to another one. Okay, so if you want information also on ships or coastal stations, so which are real time, like the buoys that we look, you can look at uh, this. Um, I think. Okay. Okay, so ship observing team. Um, then go to home. Okay, click. Okay. Very good. So it brings you to the interface, which allows you to have access to the various ships observing uh, the weather. Uh, information and also oceanic parameters over your area of interest. Now, I won't, I won't come to this place because I've been there. <laughs> Let me move up here. Okay, so if we click on this, it will load some information. Now, it will give you the operator. So it's a weather, POS, manual weather station, and it's on board a particular, okay, it says that operated by a Japan tanker over here. Now, you can come here and add layers depending on the kind of information that you want. For instance, if you want to have some analysis done, you can add this one, which will give you information where the ship or the vessel was moving, the direction that it was moving and the data it was collecting, which will even help you uh, do in your ship routes forecast or planning. Let me take this one. Okay. A minute, let it load. Okay, so the cruises to, it can also give you information on that. You click, you add, and it will be made available to you. Look at the movement on your area. Look at the movements. So all this information, aside the weather information they give to you, it allows you to know the movement in your territorial waters as well. And I know uh, uh, it's, more light to be thrown on that in, I think, session five also. Okay, also thank you very much, Mr. Baini. Um, it seems we're running out of time. So I'd like okay. to um, wrap can up I, the session I... and then we can take a few questions and answers. So if you can just wrap up and then we can okay, take let a me few wrap up on that one. Let's questions. look at uh, I just want to us look at where we can have access to wave, modeled wave data. So you can get some from ECMWF and also NOAA. Very good. Okay. So you go to forecast. If you open the ECMWF page, you go to forecast. Then you scroll down, you click on charts. When the charts open, you can select your any of the charts. But if you want to make it simple, after it loads, the charts load, you can simply select uh, the type if you want uh, wave models 
you can select and you are able to access wave model. So anything on waves or on ocean will just come up for you. So uh, because of our time, everything is in the slides, the last slide, the, those, the sources of collecting some of these data, they are there. And if you need much information or you need uh, the steps to go about it, you can email or put it in the chat and I will take you through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Baini. Um, very um, lovely insights, great insights as to the information, data access, and where we can get all this information and how we can utilize them. Um, I'm going to go to the chats right now just to see if there are any questions yet. Um, in case you forgot to put your questions in there, please do so now and then we can address them. OK, so can the instruments for the observations be installed on a ship, a voluntary ship in Ghana? And if so, what is the cost to the vessel and the regulator? And probably I'd want to clarify a bit, has GMET or Ghana Meteorological Agency ever taken up such um, an initiative to more or less volunteer equipment onto vessels or deploy equipment onto vessels to be taking um, oceanographic or meteorological readings for the institution? No, we do not have any instrument installed on any of the vessels. But as I said, these vessels that come to our ports or uh, that uh, uh, move across and into our ports, they have this instrument and they are made available on the GTS. So the only instrument I think uh, GMIT, uh, Mr. Portofi can speak to that. We have gone there before at the, uh, the one I clicked on it at 00, at 00. Uh, GMIT in collaboration with the US Navy has that one installed and it's a mod buoy. It's not a weather station installed on the ship. But in the case, uh, if you have any idea, in the case that someone wants to install such equipment on a vessel, what are the yes. processes that that person would need to go to? Are there any regulations to doing that? Or is just simply agreements between the vessel operator and the person who wants to install the no. equipment? No, the, the GMET has to come in since we are mandated to collect weather information. So I remember some time back, uh, one of, I wouldn't mention the name, uh, companies at the working area over the West Coast wanted to install, and GMET uh, had to go and audit first the instruments you are installing. Are they of uh, the standard that the BRIOM will require? So GMET has to come in. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, are there any extra questions that need to be addressed? Please feel free to put them either in the chat or in the Q&A um, section, and then it will be read out uh, to the various presenters. Also, if you had any questions from the previous sessions on uh, the introduction to Marine weather forecasting or the GMES in Africa project. We still have a few minutes. We can take those questions as well. And yes, we will be providing you with the recordings for today. Everything will be uploaded to the DLP and also to YouTube. So please um, log into the DLP and then you would find it under the various days. Unfortunately, it won't be broken down into sessions, so you have all the videos lumped up together as a single video. So you can just scroll to the various um, sections that you want, and then you can watch that. Um, so there's a question from uh, a participant from Ghana who is asking, and uh, um, can you please clarify the question? Because I don't know what you're talking about. It says, how can this be replicated on the Volta Lake for both fishing and transport? 
I don't know exactly what you mean by what exactly do you oh. mean uh, okay. the replication? I think, I think he's looking at also forecasting for the inland waters. And at the moment, GMET is forecasting for the inland waters over the Volta Lake. Maybe uh, uh, he, you are not aware of it, so you can contact us if you want to have information on the inland water. It's been done already. Not we, have, we don't do only for the marine space, but also for the inland waters. Volta Lake, to be specific. So in this case, um, without typically contacting you, how does uh, a general person who is not aware of this information get access to some of this information? Is there a website? Is there a page that yes. you can go to and get access to? Can you share this with us? Yes, please. Uh, you can go to the GMET website, www.ghanameteorologicalagency.gov.gh, uh, and you will have access to Africa. On forecast, it will take you to uh, marine forecast. And if you click on the marine forecast portal, you will see the inland water and the marine forecast over there. And it's issued every day. And if you also want to be added to a social media platform like the WhatsApp, for instance, you can be added to that one. And you receive okay. information on that. Yeah. All right. Thank you uh, very much, I, Mr. Viney. Yeah, I wanted to show the one who asked about the tides. Uh, I've opened the portal, if you can see. So this, uh, the, this is the, where we have uh, instruments installed, and you can have the tide information, which is real time. So it's loading, you can have, and we have also the modeled one, which I talked about. We have a number of them here. And for the modeled one, it can even extend to many days. Yes. So you can have for about two weeks over here. But for the port one, uh, you may not have access to it. We have access to it. Yeah. I don't know if he, you are OK with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thomas Viney, also Mr. Bennett Foley from the GMES Africa Project for joining us today in this training session. This is just day one of um, a three-day training session to come. I'd encourage you all to join us uh, tomorrow as well as we continue in this particular training. Um, tomorrow we'll be looking at two sessions also looking at the various marine weather forecasting techniques and then marine weather hazards. Tomorrow, uh, it will not just be one face like you've seen today from the Ghana Meteorological Agency we would have numerous presenters to help us with the various sessions. So I'd uh, entreat you all to log in same time tomorrow and get um, some of this information. Um, before we log out, um, I forgot one very important activity which was to get a group photo so i'd entreat you all to please turn on your cameras um, for a group photo to for this particular session if you do not mind so please turn on your cameras so i can take a quick group photo of our participants who have been with us the entire session. Oh, so a lot of familiar faces in here as well. From La Côte d'Ivoire. Hello, Jean. Hello, Mafoy. <laughs> Hopefully in the in the near future, we'll would be having courses from Kurat also to um, deal with our partners who are um, conversant with the French language. And then we'll have you as some of our experts to deal with this. Um, a few seconds more for those who still want to be in our group photo. Please uh, join us now or we'll be left out.
Okay, thank you very much for attending. I'll see you same time tomorrow. And hopefully we'll be able to have more productive discussions. So until then, have a wonderful time and have a lovely day. Thank you all for joining us.